Hello everyone, in today's video we're going to be flying the L-39. And our emphasis on this is basically when in basic operations, we're going to do a little stuff where we do some takeoff, taxi, and landing as well. Now this is a pretty neat plane, and I know it was intended to be kind of a stunt plane, but I don't know, it's actually a pretty nice cruising plane, at least from what I've seen. Let's get started. So first things first, I climb into this cockpit, I can't help but go, hmm, man, does this feel a little familiar because of the good old folks in DCS. Now, when I do take a look at this plane, the one thing that I'm looking immediately is, oh, everything is in English. Yes, that's great news for us because it means it's a little bit simpler for us. So the first thing I like to do is I like to start from one side to the other. We're going to make sure the oxygen's turned on. Looks pretty solid. We got a couple switches here that are marked and operative. Sigh. We have our two pitot heaters. Notice we have a backup one as well as a primary. We're going to leave that one on. Fuel shut off. We want to make sure this is pushed forward. Forward. Next, what we're going to do is we have our little intercom. I'm not going to adjust that too, too much. We've got our handy dandy throttle. We want to make sure this is actually pulled back to the stop. Unfortunately, we cannot pull it past the stop and actually click it in there so that um, it should be out of engagement completely. Sigh. The next thing we want to do is swing it up this way. We're just going to double check to make sure the parking brake is engaged. You actually have an emergency brake if you push it back all the way, but I've made that mistake a few times before. We're going to check to make sure the landing gear lever is down. Now, it's this little handy dandy thing. You can play with it all afternoon. Nothing bad will happen with you yet. Ah, the ACHSM1 clock. Oh man, I've always wanted one of these for my desk, but they're always like 300 bucks. It's not worth it. We're just going to make sure it's set to the correct time. Reset our handy dandy RG meter here, which looks correct. Swinging around this way, we see a pretty standard set of instrumentation. We have our airspeed over on this side. This is in kilometers per hour. Over on this side, attitude indicator. Remember, it's a Russian style, so it's reversed to the way you typically see in the West. We have our climb speed. Oh, by the way, watch out. It is in M slash S. This is in meters a second. Analogous wise, it's not quite a foot per minute. It's it's similar. It's similar. RPM, I'll come down here. We have our altitude. I'm pulling this one out of the way. We have this very, very complicated looking instrument. This is going to be for navigational purposes. Unfortunately, it is not have it does not have the RSBN system, which is kind of a shame because it's super cool. But we do have some of the other systems built in. We have the ability to control the cockpit temperature, and we have all the guns. No, there's no guns on this thing. Don't even try. We also, of course, of course, have the brakes, which won't work at this time because we have no pressure. Gotta love the stirrups on the brakes as well. This guy right here will tell you cabin pressure. We have a good some things about some pressure as well as vibration meter down here on the right. Fuel gauge, of course, that shows that we're about 800 and let's call it 850 kilograms, which is plenty. Swinging down here, we have our electrical panel. Uh, some of these electric Electrical switches are not, not, not quite right, but I'm not annoyed about it at all. I think it's actually pretty neat. Back here, we have a couple of radios as well as a transponder. We have a cabin temperature. Swing it all the way back. If you were in a situation where you'd have to go ahead and uh, have somebody in the back seat basically tell you what to do, you do have the ability to override their commands up front, which is actually pretty handy. Hydraulic pressure, you can see there's none at this time. And of course, we have this little gadget down here, which allows us to correct for magnetic variation. Can't do much for us. So let's go ahead and get started. So I'm going to go ahead and flip on the battery. Uh, that's always the first step. We have two separate sets of generators. I like how they consider them alternators. We have the engine systems. Uh, what that's supposed to do is it's supposed to flip. Yep, it works pretty nicely. Swing so it over here. We have uh, one of the inverters. Again, we don't have that functionality. A couple more inverters here. We have the radio inverter here. We have one that does not do anything. We have another one that's just for pressure. We have the emergency IFF one. You don't need that one. We don't have an RSBM. If we have wing tanks, which we do not... We'd be switching that switch. We have the de-icing option, which is a shame because it makes this little light bulb right here come on automatically if you switch that switch. It doesn't work. And then the SDU. What's the SDU? That's the SDU. Unfortunately, the SDU actually has lots of functionality, but we can't access too much of that. One thing I will do is while I'm over here, though, is I'm going to go ahead and pop on my navigation lights. You can make them nice and bright. I like to switch it to fixed lighting. And uh, they're, they're not the world's brightest things, but they're just sort of chilling right there. So that's pretty good. All right. Climb inside here, and uh, now we're ready to go. <laughs> Look at the size of this handle. It just sort of sits in your lap. <laughs> Gotta love it. Okay, so what I'm going to do is make sure my flaps are up, which they are. So we're going to pop over to the turbo starter. So the turbo starter is how we get this thing rolling. So I'm going to open up the turbo starter, and we're just going to press and hold that for a few seconds and listen for the noise. There it is. just sounds so angry. Ah, that is a lovely noise. You're just listening to that just warm up. It's awesome. And we're up to RPM. Nice. Engine minimum oil pressure. Turbine started. The light is on. We're ready to start. Starting this thing as a vacation. We flip up the switch. Press and hold. 
Now, unlike a bunch of American aircraft, uh, when we're ready to go, you can just boop, pop the throttle over the stop and just wait a few moments. So what's going to happen now is the turbo starter is going to kind of do its thing here. You're going to watch the primary turbine, which is the fast turbine, the small turbine spin up. Then you're going to see the big old turbine start to catch up moments later. So we're not going to see any fuel temperature or any temperature spikes, I should say, until the fuel catches right there. We come over 20%. It automatically introduces fuel to the engine and starts to speed up. And we are on our way once again. In a moment, we should get hydraulic pressure. Ta-da! Haha, right. <laughs> it's like I've flown this thing before. Take a look down here. You can see that this would be a brake hydraulic pressure. Keep in mind, we have our parking brake on, so this won't show anything yet. Engine's going to come rolling up. And one of the neat things is the turbine starter should shut itself off. Hear it? Ha <laughs> ha! I love that. Great detail. By the way, if you do need internal lights, you've got a little red switch right here. I'm going to pop the flaps to the takeoff position. You go push it with your finger, and now we are ready to go. Now, if we did have a specific destination today, we could come over here and actually dial in the GPS. Uh, one thing that's sort of handy with that, of course, is we have this lovely CDI function here. So we actually could push the CDI and theoretically change what this is currently locked onto. But since we don't have anything selected in the GPS, uh, we couldn't go too, too far with that. So I'm going to go pop up in the GPS real quick. Uh, we'll go pick ourselves a nice little uh, destination here. Let's do, uh, oh, since we're in Europe, we'll go ahead and pick something a little bit further away. Of course, everyone knows exactly what letter I'm going to go for in about half a moment here, but that's all right. And we'll go with EGLL. I think it's going to be appropriate. <laughs> enter, enter. Go ahead and make sure the GPS is selected. We're going to pull that out of the way. So this is basically a reference GPS. It is not a navigation GPS, which is actually kind of a bummer. So take a look at the window. Oh, I got this big angry warning light. It says error MC synchronous. Uh, what this simply means is your magnetic compass is not synchronized with the actual um, compass, the directional gyro. To fix this, there's this big handy button. You just go bonk, and bop that button and it should straighten it out. It's the same thing as pressing the D key on the keyboard. So let's go ahead and get the sucker rolling and uh, we'll get go, go to it. So I'm going to pop off the parking brake and give it just a little bit of throttle. And in a true teeny, 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 tiny, angry vacuum cleaner tradition, uh, this engine takes no time to start moving. Give ourselves just a little bit of power. We'll go ahead and pull out of this zone. And we're basically going to kind of swing this way and kind of come across that way. Now, one thing I always loved about this aircraft is the fact that, you know, it has a really, really good range if you put a couple wing tanks on. The things I don't love about this aircraft is if you do put a bunch of extra weight on this thing, it takes a lifetime to get anywhere because the aircraft literally gets up to like 15,000 feet. And it's like, yeah, I quit. Stop. <laughs> but that being said, it's not too, too bad either. I'm swinging over this way. It says it'll take me uh, 30 hours to get to Heathrow. Oh, boy. You have not seen anything yet. Find myself up. One of the nice things, by the way, of this GPS unit is that you do have a ground speed in knots. So even though this is in kilometers per hour, you're still able to identify what speed roughly that you're traveling at. I'm swinging around this way. I just like how it takes no effort to get this thing going. Now, it's a real bummer we don't have some of the old systems, like the old ARC, as far as the ADF goes, because I'd really love to play with it. I do like the GPS, don't let anyone kid you, but at the same time, as some of these kind of aircraft are just meant to be flown with some of those older systems. Or even better, having an actual RSBN, man, that would be wild. All right, we're just going to kind of ignore traffic protocols and come rolling right onto the runway here. I'm sure our people are not so thrilled about that in the real world, but hey, this is an example. Landing lights are right here. We're just going to click it towards us to activate it, and we're just going to line ourselves up. Now, remember, this thing was designed as a light attack aircraft, but more likely a two-seat jet trainer, so it is not exactly the most sprightly performing here, as we'll say. Line myself up with the big old number 24 here. We're going to go visit Prague while we're here. That looks pretty good. Looks pretty good. Go ahead and hold that brake nice and gently. That looks pretty good. One quick little system check. We're going to make sure everything's good. No angry warning lights. Good time to go ahead and reset the gyro too if you haven't done so in a while. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to smoothly apply about 75% power. And we're going to release the brakes and push it the rest of the way. And off we go. So uh, I think this aircraft has a d dirt sniffer on it. It simply means that until the dirt is detected by the front landing gear, you cannot actually bring this aircraft into the air. It's sort of like early jets, kind of a problem. All right, there's 180, 200 kilometers per hour. We're just going to go ahead and pull back gently. And this thing comes flying off the ground. Looks pretty good. Bring up those flaps. Bring up that landing gear pretty much right away once we get over. And we're going to hold a pretty steady climb speed of about 300 kilometers per hour. That's actually a bit on the slow side, but I find that 300 works fairly well. It's a good balance between going fast and going up at the same time. So, of course, we came all the way out here. Now, we might as well visit Prague. 
So we're gonna go ahead and take a nice gentle left turn here. Now one thing that will surprise you is how little rudder this aircraft needs. You know, if you're coming from a general aviation plane or a helicopter, you'd be amazed that you really, 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 really don't need to push it very hard to get it going. We're gonna come pulling up just a tiny bit here because I'm already picking up plenty of speed. Like I said, about 100, let's call it 300 kilometers per hour is gonna get you climbing pretty darn fast there. All right, we're gonna swing around, point directly at the city, and we'll go take a peek real fast. All right, there it is, right off my 12 o'clock. <laughs> we'll get a little bit of low altitude here. Now, I can't believe this, but I'm doing 260, 270 already. That is just, whew, this thing is much, 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 much faster than most of your general aviation aircraft. One thing I do know from uh, reading all the DCS books, though, is we do want to reduce the throttle a little bit here. We don't want to be ripping around at 108% all the time. Ideally, you want to be 104% or less. So right now, I'm at 100% on the uh, main, the one turbine there, so I'm not too worried about it. Such a pleasant little place. Kind of composing. Let's see, take a look at the residential neighborhoods here. Then we'll come around and bring the thing in for a nice little landing. Now, normally you can go to the nearest box. <laughs> that makes me so sad. I gotta just push it. There we go. That's a bummer. That's a bummer. All right, let's do some low altitude shenanigans while we're here. Again, very, very, very smooth handling here. In a downhill dive like this, you want to be very cautious. It does not take much to get to the red line speed in a dive of this airplane. Looks pretty good there. Kind of enjoy some of the uh, scenery. Whoa! Man, is this thing like to just surge on you. I really am expecting to see a bunch of river boats with like in you know, all glass windows carrying tourists about now. Very nice. And again, nothing crazy about its handling. Notice the attitude indicator can show when you flip upside down completely. The entire instrument flips upside down with it. And now we've brought ourselves into a perfect spot to bring it in for a landing. Now landing this aircraft is a little different than landing some other aircraft because you don't have that angry propeller. The thing tends to kind of just sort of uh, glide is the best way to describe it. But you also have the annoying jet characteristic of uh, needing to use that throttle much more aggressively during an approach. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to lose a little bit of speed. Now, this is one of the neat aircraft that actually does have speed brakes built in. You can see that lovely big red stall warning that I've got parked there, but I'm not too worried about that. All right, I'm just going to do some big old S turns. I practice our glider skills here. And you can see we're much, 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 much too close for landing there. So I'm going to go ahead and take my turn all the way out. And we're just going to slow down nice and gently. Now, the approach speed on this aircraft is uh, completely dependent on the weight. You know, if you're coming in at a very, very heavy weight, you're going to find yourself approaching at about, uh, let's call it um, about 250 kilometers an hour. Sometimes as low as 200 kilometers an hour if you are that light. Uh, keep in mind, this thing needs a lot of flaps. One thing you can do if you really, really, really want to shorten your landing distance is you can pop down the speed brakes. But I find if you pop down the speed brakes down your approach, the aircraft just kind of slows down to nothing. I think the speed brakes are just a little bit too effective. All right, come spin around, clean up our landing here. That looks pretty decent. All right, let's get all nice and dirty. Landing gear down, less than 300. Slow down, we're gonna drop down the first notch of flaps. Drop down the second notch of flaps. The flaps are coming down. I'm not gonna touch my speed brakes yet. Now this aircraft, as you start to get nice and slow with it, you're gonna start feeling the controls get very, very weak on you. So the trick here is you wanna be doing, like I said, right around 200, like I said, we're pretty light. There we go, and I get a little bit more thrust. Nice, perfect. And we're basically just gonna glide this thing all the way down to the ground. You know, we have ourselves everybody's favorite crosswind. If you feel yourself starting to get high, just pull the throttle back just a tiny bit, and it should help you get down. Now this aircraft really lets you glide it in. So we're gonna go ahead and come over the runway. I'm gonna go ahead and pull the throttle back now. We're gonna lift the nose up. Enter into that lovely ground effect. Hold that nose up and we're down. Go ahead and pop down the speed brakes. Hold the nose up because we're trying to lead off a little bit of speed here before we let the nose come down. Once you get under about 150 kilometers an hour, let the nose come down gently. Go ahead and apply some braking and we have successfully gotten ourselves back down onto the ground. So again, about 200, 225, 230, right in that distance, kilometers per hour works out pretty well for this aircraft. For a climb speed, you're gonna be looking for about 250 kilometers an hour, up to about 300 seems to be kind of the sweet spot. 
Range-wise, you could probably get several hundred miles out of this thing. Uh, Navigation-wise, kind of stuck with this GPS because we've lost a lot of the really sophisticated systems. Uh, one thing you probably did notice, however, is that the CDI right here did indicate motion to the left, which actually means if you switch your CDI to GPS mode, it will actually successfully navigate you. Now, if you're using a VOR, I have to give you a warning, make sure CDI is set onto VLOCK, and then you can actually set the VOR frequency by pressing this button and then dialing in the VOR frequency here, setting the radial you'd like to follow right here, and then you'd be on your way. But other than that, enjoy. <laughs> 